Today, we talk about honeybee viruses and hygienic behavior. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I think the first <laughs> line that I just said, I was mute, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, I'm Umberto Bon Cristiani, and this is Inside the Hive.tv, the show that takes you into the world of bees. And today, with the great pleasure that I have Dr. Jay Evans from the USDA ARS in Beltsville, Maryland Bee Research Lab. And today, we're going to talk about uh, viruses, honeybee viruses, and the potential spread of these viruses through hygienic behavior. Uh, let me brought Jay in. Jay, where are you? Hey, Jay, how are you? Hello. Fine, thanks, Umberto. Good to see you. It's very good to have you here, Jay. I'm very excited for this conversation. I just wanted to check a couple of things before. Uh, where is the chat? Oh, here we go. Hey, guys, let me know if you if everything is working well, if you can hear me well, if you can hear Jay well, so we can start this. Can you see us? Uh, and also, if you can, please let me know where you're tuning in. Uh, what country? What part of the United States? Where are you? Tell me. I would love to know. So, I oh, yeah. So I have a couple guys jumping in already. Great. So, Jay, I have a question for you. I'm going to give a little overview about why we're having this conversation um i very recently a couple weeks ago i covered uh, with one of my videos one of your papers about hygienic behavior and how cannibalism one of the parts of hygienic behavior might be a potential spreader of uh, the formal wing virus uh, it's very important honeybee viruses of honeybees and that got crazy people got really interested in this subject and there, right now, there is almost 50,000 views, and I have people skipping, asking me all kinds of questions. And some of the questions they come up with is hygienic behavior is a good thing. So I think we should, I'm going to ask you, if you can, give you a little overview what is the paper is about. Uh, if I think we have some slides for you guys at home. And then we go jumping into these main questions. Hygienic behavior is good for bees or not for bees? All right. Can we do that? That works for me, yeah. And I mean, as we talked, um, we both want to set straight that hygienic behavior per se is not bad for bees yes. or bee breeding. Spoiler it's, alert. It's, it's a beautiful trait and it's done much for the health of honeybee colonies. So so um, what we're looking at is is an interaction within the hive um, that in this case is, is, is um, um, affected by cleaning out of diseased brood but it certainly in our in our hearts in our brains hopefully and given the science behind this which which is uh the work of colleagues and bee breeders um hygienics as a whole um are are excellent targets for bee breeding i think as a whole so but yeah i will show some slides about this study yeah, so and let's, um, let's give a little overview what the the thing is about so <laughs> then i have a bunch of questions for yeah. you jay so, yeah. yeah, and and also we would love to get feedback. I, again, I see uh, queen breeders, bee breeders, as well as beekeepers, and and um, you know, you're the ones who see a, a much of these dynamics uh, on the ground in the field. So that um, is really exciting to us. Okay, let me pull this up. So, and I, I promise to be brief. I know we tend to to hide behind our powerpoints, as it were, and I'm going to try to be quick on this, uh, not do so. But I just really wanted to to note that this work is is um, a part of our bee research laboratory, the USDA. Jay, really are, you, are you sharing? Are you sharing? I, I am now, sorry. Uh, I oh. cannot see it yet. Okay, one moment. I think it does. Yeah, shoot, it has a second uh, share second button. There we button. go, sorry. Here we go, let me put okay. it in. Okay. Here we go, and now you can start the presentation. Okay, sorry about that, yeah. Yep. Here we go. So yeah, I just wanted to, to give a few slides. Um, partly because I want to advertise that this is a collaborative project and it's actually driven by this gentleman here, Francisco Posada, and Eugene Ryabov here, who's a virus expert, and my colleague Judy Chen, um, who has been working on bee disease uh, with, with all of us at the Bee Lab for quite some time. And our, we're an applied laboratory, so we're, we're doing as many beekeepers do. We're hoping to make hives uh, 
healthy and sustainable, um, at least in the US, that's not so easy. The colony loss rates are, are um, unfortunately quite high, especially uh, overwinter losses uh, take up the bulk of that. And, and we do think those are driven in large part by disease. Um, this is a, a nice review from Italy that I that I always like because, you know, it's it's it shows the interactions of different stresses and different diseases, and um, you know, and that and it, it's not that you know two out of three aren't bad or or three out of four. All of these can impact colony health. Um, but today we'll talk about this one here, which is varroa mites and the um, viruses that they are exceptionally good at moving around, and especially deformed wing virus and. And this, these studies um, were initiated by, by Eugene, Dr. Ryabov, who's been a visiting scientist with us and has been adept at really getting at experimental ways to see not just how viruses hurt bees, which we've known for a bit, but how they move around, how they're transmitted, how they persist in a colony. And, um, and this is, uh, these are the, the folks in this one particular study, but other, other colleagues in the bee lab have been um, really working to address both mites and viruses as threats to honeybees. Um, and, and the stories get worse. It's not, you know, again, analogous, unfortunately, to human viruses and disease. Um, there are new variants that pop up, and these can be worse than what we have at hand. And um, in the US, at least, the new variant is, has been called Varroa destructor virus, or DWV, deformed wing virus B, strain B. Um, and yeah, and unfortunately, in parallel in both systems, um, you know, it's kind of like the the Omicron or the Omega Micron virus in SARS-CoV-2 or or Delta for that matter. It's one that's just a little different than what we had, and the bees didn't seem as good at getting a handle on it. So it's become the predominant virus now in the U.S. Um, over about a decade. Um, this particular study focused on the old flavor of deformed wing virus. And it came out initially of an observation, and that was that uh, if you if you saw pupae, that is late stage developing bees, beekeepers know this, uh, but right here, these are these are actually early stage pupae, white eyed pupae. Um, if you see them uncapped in a colony, that usually means that that a worker bee um, carved off the capping and and maybe was starting to pull that out or at least had recognized an issue there and so the observation was that these uncapped pupae tended to have a pretty high level of virus uh this deforming virus um the 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 not so um uh shocking conclusion was that that was because they had had mites in the cells with them and those mites had transmitted virus that did quite well um, okay, disclaimer number two. Yeah, and this is, so I will talk about breeding, uh, or well, about the behavior of cleaning out these diseased pupae, but, um, but that is generally a good thing, and it goes hand in hand with other kind of survivor traits for honeybee colonies. Um, this is a, another neat review. This is from Stephen Martin in the UK, uh, showing from the top, basically the, the, the kind of nested way that you can breed for for mite numbers, um, you can breed for recapping events or for uh, you know general sur surrogates or signals we have for hygienics that could be you know pin killed brood or freeze killed brood things like that. Um, you can also measure mite mortality or the lack of uh, the ability of female mites to reproduce. Uh, and then down here on this third tier, you can measure the virus loads, and and these are all kind of targets for breeding, and they're all they all have merit in their in their own way. Um, but again, back to this study, what what we worried about is that these bees that were pulled out, like like an adult bee that's super sick, or a human for that matter who's super sick, they can act as as spreaders of virus. Um, and here's the model. So so a um you know a bee comes in and says, okay, my sister here has a mite on her. Uh, let's cut our losses and uncap and remove that sister bee and the mite, hopefully, disrupting reproduction of the mite and slowing mite uh, population growth. So at that point, um, after uncapping and just leaving the pupa naked for a while, uh, often eventually that that pupa is cannibalized. She's she's pulled out and um, kind of the, even the, the liquids of the pupa are taken up. Uh, those bees that, that are the, the feeders, as it were, on their sisters, um, 
then, as do any honeybees in the colony, often feed others. So they have this kind of, um, it's called trophallaxis. It's a feeding of brood across the colony. And, and the risk is that a freshly captured virus from this event will then be passed on to numerous other nest mates. And so here's the experiment. And these, um, we used a fluorescent uh, dye or a promoter in the viruses. Um, these are all lab experiments in, um, in cages and in the laboratory. So these are not, uh, we haven't done any of this out in the field. Um, but with this tagged virus on the left here, we know exactly that that exact virus is the one that's moving across uh, from bee to bee. Um, so first stage was simple. Let a honeybee cannibalize or chew up um, a mite infested pupa and a pupa in this case that has this labeled virus um, uh, because those mites that infested that uh, can that parasitized her um, gave her that green virus. Um, so the worker bee comes, does what it should do, which is to clean up the mess. Um, and then that worker bee, we sampled a bit later, and sure enough, and this is down here in the graph, she ends up with this labeled virus. So it, that just simply shows that the actual hygienic worker um, herself can get infected when she does this, this altruistic task. Um, so next stage is, can that hygienic worker now called the donor or this bee right here, can she further the spread of virus when she feeds her nest mates? Um, similar design, but you know, we gave them a little time after they they'd hauled out the sick pupae. And then just their only contact with their sisters is through a wire mesh. The only way they can reach each other is through their tongues. They stick their tongues through, they feed each other. Uh, and then, um, that's that's how they that's that's their their contact. Um, give it another eleven days, which is about as long as it takes for a, a, a virus that's fed upon to develop in the bee, um, and check these acceptor bees. And, and again, sure enough, at a pretty solid rate, the um, the bees whose only contact with this virus was through that feeding event uh, ended up themselves getting sick over here. So they so they are infected, and they're they're um, then also, of course, able to, to share that with other nest mates. And so this is just kind of a next um, full circle type experiment where um, we did kind of multiple uh, horizontal or transfer events of these viruses. Um, and, and sure enough, they can become circulatory in the colony. Um, and, and what we're working on now, and really the reason to do these experiments is to see how effectively a virus moves across the colony. And this, this is important in terms of, you know, this cannibal trait or this cleaning up trait. It's also just generally interesting, right? To know if you've got a super sick individual, um, and you've probably seen there've been papers recently about whether they, they do any sort of social isolation or, you know, move out of the hive or do things like that. Um, and they don't do it terribly effectively. So they're often in the hive for the rest of their lives, um, possibly foraging, but also um, in the hive. And so we really wanna get the value of how dangerous is that infected individual on all of her sisters or the queen for that matter, as, as, these, um, as they share food, which they, which they just can't not do, right? Honeybees are really, it's called a social stomach. They share their foods with each other all the time just to even the food stores out. And this is, I mean, one way to think of this, and you've perhaps have observed, um, hopefully just once in your lifetimes, uh, if you starve a colony, pretty much everybody dies at once, right? They just collapse down on, on the last day. And that's because up to that point, they've been sharing the last dregs of food with each other until they can share no more. And, and that's, that's just the way they work. They share stuff continuously. Um, so this is, again, the sort of the punchline of the story is that as they do that, um, they're moving viruses around. And again, it, it doesn't matter so much the source of the virus infection. In this case, it's, it's this cannibal act. Um, this could also be true perhaps for a heavily infected bee who herself had grown up with a varroa mite and was infected. Um, but in, in the case of these, these bees that had fed on a, a sick sister, um, and in the course of, of cannibalizing her, uh, the food is still in the gut and, and the crop actually, and it can be shared pretty readily. So, um, so that, that was that study. And again, just, just to highlight, there are other, um, 
uh, ways to limit the impacts of these sorts of things. Uh, the first would be to get rid of the mites, which started the infections uh, in most cases. And these are the you know various hygienic or mite reproduction reproductive reduction traits and VSH varroa sensitive hygiene, which are which are good traits. They will help limit mite numbers. Um, there's also been some really neat work, and and we're we're trying to do some of this as well on virus resistance. Um, there's a couple papers in the last, literally the last month on, um, on virus resistance. So, so there are other ways, both in breeding um, and management that, that those impacts can be reduced. And so we're um, really interested that while this points to a warning sign for viruses moving around in the colony, um, you know, the, the key here is that it might be mitigated might be helped by by breeding um in the longer term it could also be helped uh, by other ways and and i just want to highlight uh, some work in our lab driven by steve dr stephen cook uh to to knock out the mites by management and you know again we we all see uh that the breeding is a long term and and arguably the um, favorable uh, direction for disease resistance but um in the short term there are ways to control mites and many people choose to do so. Um, what Steve's group is doing is to find new and maybe safer ways to do that. And he's he's become, uh, for a scientist, and, you know, I give him credit, he's become adept at the regulatory side of all this stuff, um, something I'm, I'm quite inept at. And he's been able to, uh, you know, work on testing compounds and then actually push them steadily along their path um, with partners to get um, to get licensed, which is a which is a long haul for that, and um, and that's one way to do it. Um, we also have uh, uh, Dr. Sammy Ramsey in the lab, and he's so Sammy's thinking big. He wants to get all the way up to um, just a wall, a wall such that the mites can't touch the bees and they can't. Um, do their thing when they get in with cells. And I'm trying to show you real quick one of his uh, videos here, which he's gathering some really high resolution, cool videos. And you've, you've perhaps seen this because he's gives he's very adept at good at giving talks as well. Um, and his his might solution of of the future would be to um, to by simply you know really understanding this interaction to get those mites. Uh, confused enough that they choose not to reproduce on a developing bee. And that, again, would be a great way to get around stuff. Uh, and then, and somewhat selfishly, I wanted to highlight some of our work, which is really targeting the viruses. So we're looking at medicines, uh, not for mites, not for nosema, not for chalk brood or the foul broods, but um, new medicines that might target might uh, target viruses. And um, and that's been really fun. And uh, um, Umberto knows much of this and has helped um as a virologist really helped helped guide us in many of this these projects as well so so that's um one of the angles that we're looking at uh now even into the winter um so i'm going to stop there because i know what you really came for is to talk about um how viruses move around beehives and um but i'd be happy and i know umberto would be happy to answer more general questions on bees and bee health as well Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. That's very nice of you to spend your time with us here today. Uh, so let me go back a little bit and just get into the mind of a beekeeper. That, and I got so many questions from them. And so now we have this in our mind. Uh, sorry about my dogs. It's a live event. So that's what happens when you do things live. Uh, we have, we know for a fact now that hygienic bees are able to transmit viruses, but we, for sure, this was along for millions of years, right? So this was happening way, way before you were able to sh demonstrate that scientifically with the, the green uh, virus that it, the lab was able to create to, to make sure that really happened. A, a, pure scientific demonstration of the transmission. So, but this is still happening. So, and we know that hygienic bees are better. Uh, I know that, I think you know that, a lot of the breeders out there know that when you, so how, what's the Im impact of that? What are the consequences? What, what do you think uh, is our learning, uh, main message that we are learning from, from such experiments? Yeah, it's a good impact. Well, one practical outcome um, 
is that you know if you wait too long to treat your mites and get the vector population down as it were um these dynamics are in full swing right so you'll have a shadow effect of those mites for months afterwards because of this so the the bees that are developing under high mite loads uh, more of them are coming out either being cleaned hygienically or um or just emerging as adults, right? And they're coming out as a source of virus for their nest mates. And that's, you know, and this is many people have written about this um, uh, in, in different avenues of how, you know, if your mite levels build to a certain amount, and it unfortunately it's a lower threshold than it used to be, um, you know, if they get above that fairly low threshold, and these these viruses are pretty tough now, they, they are able to get, a hold and then even if you clear out all of the mites uh that virus is is circulating throughout the colony and it's and it's um it's not that it's too late but you will have impacts um shortened bee lifespans for example from those those kind of steady drain of viruses in the colony and and so yeah i would say one thing is is another warning sign that that actually that might control and it could be through breeding or better bees that keep mite numbers down or through treatment or through brood breaks or through um you know, other ways that people can can uh, can safely manage their mite loads. Uh, those have a long lasting impact, you know, over months of, of keeping that average by, and we're never gonna get rid of viruses or probably mites for that matter, but the virus, it's the virus level. It, I mean, I've talked about, yeah, one study that we did a while ago with uh, Benjamin Denat, who was a visiting a graduate student here, um, showed that, the colonies that were collapsing it, it you didn't see anything you didn't see bees with deformed wings you didn't see these sort of really chronic signs of virus um but the middle-aged bees were the ones dying so they might the bees kind of get up to you know do their thing they, they can start foraging even or or in winter they can get through to january february but statistically they start dying at a younger age because they're carrying a, even a little bit of virus and that's the problem so they started dying at a younger age and the bees in that study did not make it through winter because the the colony force um just dwindled steadily there's a steady creep of uh bees dying off from virus and and so and in that case uh, with a mite treatment and lower virus loads the bees did not have that effect they were able to stay strong um in through the winter and actually the colonies survived at a much higher rate interesting jay so i, I was thinking about that another day because one of the questions of uh, the followers they they said umberto you 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 covered in a video before that bees are much more is stronger against virus infections if the infections happen through the mouth you know if by if the bees are feeding the virus is much stronger. You need much more viruses to make a bee sick through the mouth than if you inject them. So that we know that. That's why we know that varroa destructor is the biggest problem because the virus goes straight to the fat bodies in the hemolymph of honeybees, creating a big problem. So all the defenses that was evolved throughout evolution was gone in one shot. And I was thinking about that because... I think the hygienic behavior is probably one of the bottlenecks that create that uh, the process of evolution to to create those resistance bees through the digestive gut uh, against viruses. Because when you do the hygienic, because you probably do this with every single every single uh, disease that you have there, you have many different cues: cues for bacterial disease, cue for for a, a, whatever death means for for the for the brood, so the bees are able to process that, get to the, the gut, is spread to everybody, and there is also mechanisms to pass to the other generations and blah blah blah. But you know all this system it was happening all the time, and the bees that survived that are the bees that we have today. So I think that explains why very likely uh, that's the bottleneck why. Most of the defenses against viruses are in the digestive system of honeybees, and if you put directly in the hemolymph, they're gone. Do, do, do you would you agree with that? <laughs> I would, yeah. And and, and actually, it, make, it reminds me of another. You know, every study is sort of a 
piece of the puzzle, uh, we did not measure mortality in these bees. So yeah, we, that's we, what my third question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jump the gun. Sorry, I shortened your show. No, um, yeah, we did not um, show that that receiving the virus from these cannibals or hygienic bees or bees that it cleaned out um, was impactful. We did quantify the virus levels, though, so we do know, you know, compared to say a mite parasitized bee and 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 the steady state background virus how much virus was there and so that and they were substantial they were you know significantly um present but but yeah you're, you're it's a really good point of of actually the difference between um getting a virus that way from a sister say or or or, or actually being the bee that chewed on the on the um the dying bee uh, versus getting it from a mite. Clearly, the ones that were parasitized by the mites, either as larvae or adults, or larvae slash pupae or adults, um, you know, even the adult bees that have phoretic or hangers on mites on them, that transference of virus is, is very potent, as you said. Um, and so, what we're looking at here is maybe these are, you know, maybe they're not going to die soon, but by passing them around, they might in, initiate a virus in bees that are themselves then, um, you know, a source of food for mites. They're parasitized by mites, and then that virus gets into the mites and continues its cycle. So, so we do think we're sustaining, in a way, a virus population, and that has bad uh, <laughs> kind of outcomes, as it were. Um, but we don't know if the actual individual bees that are that are driving that that sort of post mite, you know pattern yep. virus if they do badly but um it's a great question i i think we'll have to look yeah. at that it might be a similar design but look at that exact question is a good one yeah there is a lot to explore there uh so today we, the, the systems we have to select hygienic bees you know it, normally we you go there with uh, you know with liquid nitrogen and we freeze them and then we have a, a way to quantify them and the, the ones that respond to that test, we, we pick the genetic of them to propagate more. That's basically how we select for hygienic bees today. I, I was wondering if there is any other way we can do this with specific cues, uh, Jay, because right now we're, we're selecting that. What cues we have there that we could say is that the right cues for hygienic bees that you want to select? Or there is any other way that we can do this better? For example, there is any way that we can select the bees that do hygienic behavior but do not cannibalize? Or, you know, do you know what do you know what we know about those cues? I have a person that I'm thinking I'm poking the person that work with this to bring to the channel. So uh, but I wanna I wanna know from you. Do you know if you how much we know about those cues? Because I, I don't know much about them. Yeah, I actually read a there was a comparative paper recently um, from France actually where they they did the freeze killed brood versus pin killed brood, which is again another kind yeah, of yeah. strategy for for measuring hygienics um, versus this sort of suppression of mite reproduction. With a, and and all three can co vary. I think the pin killed actually was one closest to the um, overall mite resistance in that in that particular population, which may not be true but it just suggests that they're the cues that those bees are using are that and they're they fall out with genetics they've been pushed into the population and especially in survivor stock um but they can be a little bit different and to me that's exciting because it means like that means you could meld this hygienic lineage over here with one that that's a mite biter or that's a you know a, a, that suppresses mite reproduction so there's there's three or four possibly flavors of of might slash virus, well, vector resistance, I guess, and and they're all um, compatible with each other. So I think, uh, and then just as a as a way, and I think um, there's a great study also recently by Barbara Locke, L O C K E, in Sweden, and colleagues. Um, it's in Scientific Reports. I, I think I had it in the slides there, but it. Um, it compared the the sort of Swedish, um, the Gotland bees that are survivor stock, uh, similar population from Norway, a population from Denmark, and then the one from um, from Avignon in France. So they're all four kind of untreated, long-term surviving stocks with mites. Um, 
And they had very different mechanisms of, of mite management, as it were, on their own. Um, uh, and and what, what seemed to set them up too is they all had some sort of virus resistance too. So, so in pushing them to survive mites, they either push them to survive or tolerate uh, viruses. And tolerance is a double-edged sword. It means um, it's like, you know, some of us, uh, you could carry a, you could carry a virus uh, and never show, never skip work, right? <laughs> you never show symptoms. That means you're tolerating, you know, a virus infection. Um, you're not resisting it per se because it's still maybe circulating in your body, um, but it doesn't slow you down. You go off to work and, and uh, unfortunately, that means you're also uh, perhaps sharing that virus with others instead of staying home and protecting others. Uh, but it, it's a very true trait for humans and for bees that that you can have, um, you know, viruses in your cells in your body, and yet you don't live it. You know, it doesn't shorten your lifespan or change your behaviors. And so the bees that they were finding in these survivor stocks, and these are four like independent lineages never met each other as it were for bees um they all showed some level of this this sort of virus uh, resistance as well or tolerance and and um yeah and, I'm, and again i'm saying this is i don't in nor in research or anything i'm not a i'm not a bee breeder but i i do think there is hope for both the mite um keeping mite numbers down through various ways like you've mentioned and if you if those bees can't keep the mite numbers down to at least uh deal in a better way with the virus infections that will follow. That's hope. That's hope. We all here need hope. Uh, <laughs> bees are a little problematic right now in some places. Uh, so let's see if I can get some questions from the people here, Jay, to see if we can sure. make this conversation even more interesting. So guys, now is the time. If you have questions, I, I think I saw a question from, oh, this is a good question. That's for you, Jay. And come from Dr. Carab Wanagor. All right. Yeah. I see lower viruses load in hygienic economies compared to controls. Couldn't shorten the lifespan of cannibals or social mechanisms like isolation be preventing spread of viruses within hygienic economies? Yeah, I hadn't, mm. yeah, I think the, um, there's, these are hard experiments, but I think researchers like, like Dr. Wagner and others, I think can tackle them now where you tag bees that are sick and bees that are healthy. And if they are able to, you know, well, one, they, they should still perform a role for the colony, I suppose, maybe foraging, but, but in other ways kind of, uh, limit their, um, their, their roles as vectors to other bees, uh, that social isolation or the, the, um, you know, kind of shunning as it were of sick bees is, is it could be bred into them. I don't know that anyone's, you know, measured it yet at that level. Um, and I haven't heard, as she mentions that it's connected with other hygienic traits. Uh, that's really exciting. Cause that again shows that probably completely different genetic mechanisms are at work. Um, yeah. One, one for, you know, as most times it's measured just for cleaning out the mites and one for that. But, um, but I believe it, especially if, if she or if, and if others are, you know, as part of their experiments are, are, um, just are favoring colonies that, that simply survive without a lot of human impact. Um, that's super exciting. Yeah. But, K um, Kara, yeah. if you are listening, I demand you in my show. You have to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she would give a good <laughs> you story. Have that, to no, come. I think that, that now is a is an invitation could... live, and you cannot <laughs> say no to that. That could be the future. Yeah. Since no. you're and here, I don't. No. I don't know. Um, again, we had the. I guess our our cannibals, as it were. Well, they had to live eleven days or nineteen days. I guess nineteen twenty days. Um, and I don't think I can ask uh, Francisco or Jean. I don't think there was any difference in survivorship to that point. But these are these are in the laboratory in, in cups. So things might be different if they had to really work for a living out there. Yeah, I I try different things with commercial guys all the time um, to, to see if we can, you know, sometimes we have cues. We, we think we have cues. Bacteria are different from the cues from the viruses and different from the cues from, from the mites. And there is combination. 
Oh, Kyra, Kara just said, I'll be there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That will be fun. Kara specializes her work in hygienic behavior, so she might know all this, the answers for all these questions that we have here today regarding the cues. So, Kyra, thank you. Thank you. That will be fun. So I, I'm always trying these different things with commercial guys here and there to see if, we, if there is any impact, but nothing, nothing really come out. Uh, like we need something that can uh, we we need to identify those cues and separate them and have a have some kind of menu. Like okay, in this part of the this region, we have problems with these bacteria. Can we select based on these cues? Uh, a B that is better for this bacteria. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's the kind of questions that commercial guys come to me. Can we find a way to select bees specifically for our location? So I, I, I'm all all in for for you know selection, local selection. So local selections to me is one of the best things that you can possibly do. So let's see, let's see if we can get more questions here from people. Jay, uh, let me see. Are you guys shy today or? Oh, just one second. So I'm going to find some questions here, Jay. I need to go through a couple of things here. I, can you give a little overview about that paper about the natural compounds? There is any natural compounds that people be looking for against viruses? There is any, is that published? Um, it, the, yeah, one screen with the actual compounds, for, uh, well, we've done one that's published in 2017 and then one's coming out right now. Um, again, these are any, even a natural compound, um, getting the dosage right, especially at the colony level is tricky. So I don't, I don't know that, you know, these are, um, ready, ready to roll out as a treatment. Uh, but there are, there are some plant nectar compounds that are, that are historically known to be anti-parasitic and, and uh, especially antibacterial. And some, um, have, have, have again, in, in kind of controlled settings do reduce virus levels. Um, what we're thinking it, uh, is, is it, is, yeah, well, first, I think there need to be sort of larger scale colony studies yeah. to make sure it works. But um, it and it may be a blend. Um, it may be that certain ones are more effective for uh, mitigating or affecting the gut, the gut microbes, some beneficial and others are truly antiviral. Um, so I guess I, I want to go out and put a recipe in the chat just yeah to, yeah don't yeah but i that, that but never I, win yeah, it is promising and i and there are a number of groups uh michelle professor michelle flanagan in montana state is doing some similar work neat stuff there's a couple uh, groups in in europe um who are who are finding things uh and some of the some are as simple as as sort of leaf extracts and you know uh, as, as, as you know, Umberto, some of our yeah. products literally involved going to the local health food store and getting, um, oh, yeah. we, had, we had the pizza project, right? That, yeah, uh, let's get everything <laughs> that, uh, that have the, the Jillian, word natural. Julian Lopez's project, which involved oregano and garlic and, yeah. um, and some yeah. of those are, those are, those are actually part of this new paper that's coming out this week. And, and some of those have some promise and, and it's only, it's not totally random. These are things that had been, uh, thymol and such compounds of, of, herbs especially have been recognized as being antiviral uh even in human use so so it's sort of a semi-directed search but um and, and i wouldn't say it's it, anything quite yet is as potent as say some of the antibacterial antibiotics but um but yeah now i'm excited about it oh, especially excited again seeing some of the the the, the difficulties challenges in in um actually uh helping folks uh, get things to market is that that many of these are already in the food stream for us as humans and so they they arguably will be um easy to uh, find an, an easier sell in terms of of uh, testing for for uh, being safe for bees and beekeepers and honey consumers it, it is important easy to find cheap 
Easy to might, handle. Yeah, yeah, it could be that. It could be as yeah, it, I am. It could I be am a working. Thing. <laughs> I'm working a video about those, so I, you yeah. you're probably gonna need to come back. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll eagerly listen because I again I think this is this is this is not unique to our group. There's there's a lot of uh, interest, yeah, a lot of I've learned a lot in the last year just from other people's progress too. So okay, I have a question here. I'm gonna put this here live to everybody. So. Uh, do diseased bees leave their hives when robbed, mm. join the robbers' colonies, drift, and infect the robbers? They certainly could, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, would follow, yes. they would drift or follow them home, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Their bees don't like to be alone, so if they have any life left in them, um, they share. They share they everything would, they, they would, got. Yeah, with whoever yeah. is around them. Yeah. And the robbers, of course, and I know this has been discussed for the foul broods, for example, is a danger of having your dead outs left out even. But the robbers collect brood. Um, they cannibalize their yep. their victims, as it were. And um, so there, it, it's a very good way for a, a collapsing colony to share what possibly what made it collapse with the, and that, that could be um, pesticides in the nectar for that matter too, or the pollen. But yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, um, yeah, it's a challenge because we can't watch your bees all the time, all the time, and bees colonies die out as I showed at a pretty high rate. So, but those colonies, as they're in a collapse, are are not generally going to help their neighbors very much. All right, so you got your answer. So let's one one more here. Is this a concerning colonies with low virus load? I'm looking yeah. to uncapping all the brood to get a broodless hive for oxalic acid. Could mm -hmm. this mess of uncapped brood cause too much virus transfer? Oh, well, um, yeah, that's a good oh. question. It, 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 <laughs> most most uh, sealed brood, which is you know the pre pupae and then largely you know, it, it, statistically eighty some percent truly pupae um, is clean. That's one of the cleanest life stages. It's really just the ones that had mites feeding on them that that are that are thick with virus. So it's it's probably not. I mean, it's it, as let's say there's a couple thousand pupae exposed pupae. They're probably no more contagious than a couple thousand worker bees or they're less they're cleaner than a couple thousand worker bees having said that if you're clearing out brood it may be better just to freeze it anyways um i don't think maybe the nutritional gain of workers eating and it's a lot of work maybe too to pick out you know hygienically a, thousands of cells so for the worker bees um yeah that's so right. yeah i would i guess it's something i had it's a new question for me i i i would guess better to just put that frame in your freezer and and not return it to you know feed yeah. the brood, feed the brood to your chickens or whatever you know people do with with brood and get get the wax maybe back eventually but um it uh, yeah it could be a risk it's a good question though all right joe thank you for your question let me see here what we got Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, let's let's f do a f philosophy one for you, too, Jay. Uh, I saw that one. Oh, put me on the spot, huh? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, very good question. Yeah. Yep. Uh, there are um, yeah folks, colleagues at the USDA in Baton Rouge who have worked on that at North Carolina State University and Dave Tarpey's lab um, too. And just the, the the actual integrity of different populations, even apiaries of bees. Um, apiaries, I guess you have somewhat control, uh, not necessarily with the drone aggregations, but I mean, there's, there's a little bit of signal there is, you know, keeping that. But yes, uh, and, and we're part of it too. We order package bees from various places with queens. And so there is a, a movement from a very few places of, of um, 
uh, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of queen bees every year. And um, that, that tends to slow the rate of selective forces for sure. Um, how to get around that, I'm not sure. I think, I think there are breeders who are, you know, um, I know some of the California bee breeders kind of form a bubble and maybe try to adopt common techniques. I think that's really admirable. Um, to try to try to maintain a you know kind of a selective force uh, at a regional level, maybe a county even level, uh, probably not a whole county, but at least big enough to make an impact. Um, yeah. And then some queen breeders, I think, really struggle and and try to keep their mating yards separate and and um, yeah, and that's about uh, honestly, that's probably all one can do. Um, I also hope and think that some of the larger breeders will adopt. Uh, maybe more um, uh, selective uh, techniques for for this, but it's it's you know I'm not a business person, so <laughs> yeah. I but, can't. But how about diversity, genetic diversity that we have here, Jay? I, I was talking with Mohammed in, at the B the, the Belsu lab, and he was mentioning to me that there is very strong evidence that the, the variety of genetic variety here is really low compared with other places. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I still in conversation with him, I'm very likely going to bring him in, but that might be another I mean, bottleneck to, you know, to, to reach um, conditions. If you don't have the genetic, how can you select for it? Uh -huh. I, I don't know. I'm yeah. speculating. Here. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I will say that the people who have selected for, say, hygienic behavior, um, even for survival in the U.S. with our with our populations, um, have found variation in those traits that's breedable. It's there's genetic variation, so I don't think we're so homogeneous that we can't find these good traits. Um, I think the bigger force is what the what um, the question addressed, which is the the drip of those traits against um kind of a more non-selective force of genetics uh <laughs> that seems harder to deal with than than yeah. finding the traits it's hanging on to what you've got i guess and and um I, you know one again sort of tool on the horizon that's that i think is getting closer and there's folks using it is is using genomics using a, a way of sequencing the really good varieties for whatever metric you want to use um, which doesn't fall out with, you know, Italian carniolan and such that much. It falls out with what, um, and, and the Russian bee is one example. It's, it's not a single race of honeybees, but it was, yep. and I know, no Tom Rinderer, you know, from his research days, and he, he's a very stubborn man and he pounded and Lilia de Guzman down there pounded those traits into those bees, uh, yep. over years and years of, of you know, and, and uh, uh, Stephen Coy, all the, you know, some of the breeders who are using them now are, are um, just, you know, they have to relentlessly try to keep pushing that trade in there. Um, but the but the bees themselves are not uh, originally any particular lineage of resistant bees. Uh, I mean, they were from a region that had, you know, long term mite exposure, but they it, that really came about and continues to come about because there's a selective force on them. And, and which is great. It's succeeded. It's been highly successful doing that. Yeah, I, I have guys that I work with. They're always complaining. They give up to buy special queens because they don't have the resources to to find a way to keep that genetic in their environment because mm -hmm. they lose that in a couple rounds and they're mm -hmm. mad at that. There are ways to go with that, but you need to you need bees. You, you need to know your neighbors. You need to know a lot of things before you. Yeah. <laughs> Beekeeping is always fascinating. Okay, Jan Stapler, I know you're here. I know you have three parts comment, and I don't, I'm not sure I got it. So I'm going to try to, together with Jay, figure it out what you're asking here. Okay, let's start with the first one. Okay, Jan, so three parts. When the floor is dirty, I swept the floor. The sweeping exposes dust to everyone as the floor is swept, but the floor is clean. Okay, number two. If I don't sweep the floor, there isn't that exposure 
to the sweeping dust, but the floor is still dirt, which leads to continued exposure. I see where you're going. Number three, which is worse, exposure to sweeping dust or continually dirt floor and continued exposure. In other words, isn't the removal of the problem the main action to prove the best positive impact? Mm -hmm. Another, mm -hmm. we're gonna need to, yeah, I, I like this community. I really like, they come heavy. And you're in the spot, Jay, I'm, I'm just a host. Yeah, oh, I get it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, you know, I, I live so what's yeah is yeah. a circle what's 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 bad what is good and should yeah. we should we sweep the floor or not oh yeah so and if we're if we want to really live the lives of bees and be altruistic to each other we should certainly sweep the floor right because our problem is our neighbor's problem so at one level i think i mean again this isn't always practical but um it, it, it is practical in terms of you know health control maybe might control um issues that that we we can be either we can be part of the problem in terms of not sweeping or not um doing that and in a in a and again and i am now for the past eight years an actual hobby beekeeper after not being much of a beekeeper but just a researcher for 20 some years um and i i go out of my way to find bees that are really nice hygienic and I, traits i tr try to try to do that so um but i'm not making a living doing beekeeping so i don't want to make judgment on people who buy queens buy packages um you know with other with other criteria but but i think we can uh the hobby beekeepers perhaps you know commercial beekeepers uh can uh demand more in our queens and the breeding stock and there's there's people out there making those queens so i think it's worth investing in that if uh if you can so. yeah i will go with that too uh for now i see i i think yeah <laughs> it is it is philosophical uh, and that keep us keep me thinking about many other aspects of my life, you know, as a human society, what would, what would you do? You know, can we, we're going to eliminate <laughs> the people around us or how we do with that? We need to be consistent too in the way we think. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I love it. That hasn't it. worked especially well. Yeah, we, <laughs> especially well as it were. So yeah, we'll just leave it at yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So Martin Paul is asking, have you done any trials between breeds to analyze oh, hygienic behavior? Gosh, I don't. But I think Kyra said she would. She could address us passing the buck. We we are we Kyra, don't. We um, need you here. Yeah, you do need a someone who's actually working with breeding and genetics. Um, that's not something I do. So I in our our lab we do have um, Dr. Mohammed Abaraki who's who's worked with strains of bees and genetic genetic diversity, but. We're not in a place where we can breed um, for traits like this, unfortunately, but we rely on our colleagues to do that. And uh, there are a number of good colleagues doing this. Um, it, I, I, again, I don't think it falls out though with Italian carniolin and, and such, even the virus resistant studies, uh, Michael Simone Finstrom um, and uh, Kristen Healy, I think down at Louisiana State, he's at the Baton Rouge lab, they just came out with a paper on virus resistance in bees. And yeah, it won't get, you won't have a great predictive value with Italians and Carniolans and Cacosica and stuff like that. Uh, each of which, is, and the good news there is each of them is capable of, of um, you know, they have the genetics hidden in there to, to be resistant to various things. And, and um, but it doesn't fall out with the, the sort of subspecies or races of bees very well. Yeah, bees are very flexible, very flexible. It's a beautiful genetic. Mm -hmm. Jay, this is for one, and I think it's for a study you did almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. How about that in American fowl brood? Oh, well, that's a, that is one that only infects only young larvae. Um, chop brood gets its start better in very young larvae, but fowl, American fowl brood is especially only able to infect 
sort of first in star larvae and um, um yeah yeah so so, so some diseases uh, in fact specific windows of opportunities right in the development of uh, so this is something that people ask me uh about the form of wing virus you know how how the the wings got mm -hmm. deformed you know it's a very specific win, a window in the development of the honeybee that you have the right amount of bee uh, uh, right am amount of virus the right genetic of the virus combination with the right genetic of the honeybees in a specific timing to reach those cells that are going to cause a problem there if you move if you lose that window the bees is going to still sick it's going to have all the other symptoms of uh, the form of wing virus infection, but you're not going to have the problem in the wings. So it's everything about timing and you know, when those receptors or cells are exposed to the pathogen itself. So yes, I, yes. that was that was mm -hmm. how, how long ago, Jerry? You you get the article with 12, 18 years ago, American Fall Brood, and you find out it was first Easter, and then after that wasn't or something like that well we think what they seem to be doing is responding better their immune response okay is kind so, of still not quite on par in that first instar and then eventually they could kick in and so, get so ahead they, of the bacterium and again american fowl brood is one where it's just a few spores are deadly so they have to clear the infection not just kind of slow it down a little bit they can um, other diseases it's more of a of a race where they're keeping maybe just ahead of it, for example. I'd say chalk brood, for example, it doesn't always mummify, it's carried and, um, you know, maybe there's a longer window when the bee can fight back. Okay, this come, I think, is for me, because I brought this up with a video that I made. What about a CSK hive environment? One study found that acetic somehow opens the and dissolve viruses. Um, so yeah, this is still it's just when I when I guys at home when I bring those videos about scientific, it's not a yes or and it's never a yes or no kind of thing. It's just it's just a information that come up pretty new that we, we together as a community need to digest together. So the fact that I brought in the video was that, yes, acidic environment apparently have implications with one family of honeybee viruses, Iflaviridae, and that includes the form of wing virus, uh, sac brood virus, and uh, it's low bee paralysis virus, I guess. And yes, so if you low the pH, apparently the cap seed opens and that have all consequences, but you cannot you know, the bees have specific pHs inside the hives for specific reasons. You cannot just, okay, let's forget about what the bees needs. Let's keep everything, the pH down, and then we kill all the virus and probably kill the bees too. So we need to be very careful with, with the associations and the correlations with the new information we're getting in. So that's why we, we do those live streams so we can discuss, we can go into details, can maybe try to get some protocols here together. Uh, sometimes, yeah, so that's the new information. And that's where I'm going to stop. So we need to do more testing. That's always the my my advice here. Okay, let's see if we get something extra here, Jay. Kara uh, is saying to mop the floor. <laughs> Good. So, oh, mop yeah, it, yeah. not just sweep. She wants yeah, them just gone. Mop, mop Good. the floor. <laughs> All right, uh, I don't see questions, guy. I think you guys have, oh, look at that. One of the, I'll put it here, Eugene. Eugene is here with us, one of the authors of these articles that we're discussing here today. And he thinks that mopping the floor is better long-term. Yeah. yeah. And I also need you here, Eugene. You're, you, you're yeah. coming. <laughs> Yeah, and what he suggests, which is what this study that he was leading on showed, is that you could have a magic bullet and remove every mite in the colony after this has started going and still have the shadow effect maybe the rest of the season into the winter and, and hurt the bees. So there's, um, 
you know, there's a there's a risk, kind of a long longer term risk, I guess. Yeah. All right. So this is what I think we got somewhere. Um, I want to thank you, everybody, to join us today for this discussion. I want to thank you, Jay, for your time to come here. Uh, it's always nice to to have the scientist itself have the gut to go in public and ask some questions, <laughs> yeah, answer some wow. questions live is, in the internet. There is no I, filter here. <laughs> I normally speak with ten people at a time, and here we are. <laughs> uh, we uh, we reach around a hundred people live now, so so we're getting okay. somewhere. All right. Okay. Thank cool. you, everybody. And I, I want to say thank you to my Patreon, too, uh, for allowing to, this to happen. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Victor.